Good morning, church family and ministry friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online internet around the world church service. And yes, I am so happy that you are here today. Let's begin today in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And I want to look at a verse. We've seen it before many times, but I want us to make sure that we do not isolate this verse by itself, but that we see it with the correct lenses. Praise God. This verse is found in uh, chapter 10 of Ecclesiastes and it's verse number 19. We're going to receive the tithes and the offerings, and then we're going to jump into a very important and insightful message today. But let's go to verse 19. And of course, these would be the words of King Solomon. And he said, a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. One translation says that money answers all things. My friends, again, let's make sure that we don't isolate this verse and lift it out of its biblical context. I have heard some Christians say that money answers all things. There is a, maybe we could say a half truth to that. In other words, even here, a feast is made for laughter. Well, if you're going to have a feast, somebody has to pay for the food and wine makes merry. Somebody has got to go down and buy the grape juice, praise the Lord, buy the sweet tea or Coca-Cola, whatever it is that you want to drink. But money answers everything. But my friends, there are areas that money can't touch. I want you to understand that when it says money answers everything, you have to view that from the perspective of covenant practice. Money answers everything for the believer that utilizes wealth, that utilizes money with an eye as being a covenant practitioner outside of the kingdom, outside of the covenant usage. Money has all kinds of things that it cannot answer to. I don't know why, but lately uh, we have been seeing in the news the deaths of many famous former actors or celebrities that have died from diseases that are incurable. And yet, with all of their money and them utilizing their money to access any possible means of deliverance or healing, yet they have come up short and they were taken out by a disease or sickness, cancer, whatever it might be, that terminated their life. Some of them dying in their 50s, some dying in their 60s. But whatever the case is, even with their multiplied millions of dollars in their bank account, money could not answer to them the most pressing situation or trial that they were going through. My friends, money has a purpose. And that purpose is for covenant practice. Think for a moment about the children of Israel. God delivered them out of Egypt. And when he delivered them, he made sure that there was compensation for all of those years when they were subjected to slavery. And then before they left, they were able to plunder the gold and the wealth from the Egyptians. But did you notice that? Once the Israelites have left Egypt, they have crossed miraculously through the Red Sea, and they are now in the area of the Sinai Peninsula, out in that desert type area. It's fascinating that once they got over there in this desert area with no shopping malls, uh, you know, uh, no tourist attractions, uh, no, in other words, nowhere really to spend all of this money or wealth that they now have, they get over there. And one of the first things God does is he has Moses receive an offering for the building. Watch this for the building of the tabernacle. So Moses said, those that would like to give gold, silver, bronze, precious stones, precious garments that will be used in the construction of the facility. It is now time to raise an offering because we're going to build the tabernacle, the, pre the place where God's presence will dwell there between the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. All of these things were going to be created and made. 
It required a lot of gold. In other words, there was a purpose for the wealth that the Israelites were experiencing. Why? It's covenant wealth that has a covenant purpose, which is what? Kingdom building, soul winning, hallelujah, being a blessing through the body of Christ to the world. I tell you that the church is destined to shine its brightest here in the end times in which we are experiencing. So again, let's be careful with this verse. Money answers everything. Yes, from a kingdom covenant practicing perspective. But if you're not using it for covenant purpose, to further the kingdom of God, to further the preaching of the gospel, then it will lose its value. It will be misappropriated and then it is sent off in directions where it cannot help and it cannot deliver. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. My friends, these are things that we have to be aware of in the time in which we are living. Praise God. Malachi chapter 3, uh, verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Do you notice how so many Christians want to argue with the Lord instead of just saying, Lord, you're right. I haven't been obedient in that area. So we try to uh, find wiggle room to uh, excuse our behavior of not measuring up to the requirements of God. And so we say, in what way have we robbed you? And the response in tithes and offerings. We want to follow biblical principles so that the gospel will go forth and so that our lives are bettered. God lives in heaven. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Our God is the God of abundance. He is the God that created gold and platinum and all of these precious metals and everything else and all the technology, the ideas for that that are released into the earth all originate from God. But my friends, God in heaven with streets of pure gold and you know, a city that has gates where the gates are made of solid pearl. God does not need our $20. God does not need our thousand dollars. The sowing, the giving is not for his benefit. It's for ours. Praise God. Amen. So money answers all things in kingdom perspective. It gives us the opportunity, first of all, to obey biblical commandments, to enjoy principles of faith and to sow seed and to come into covenant with God so that we have protection and blessing and the open windows of heaven of fresh ideas and blessing falling upon us on a constant basis. Praise God. Mm -mm. Bring all the tithes into, into the storehouse there, there may be food in my house and try me now on this says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. There are a lot of people that have a lot of money, but they don't tithe. Why? They don't know God and they are outside of the covenant of salvation. And also they are outside of even a financial covenant. So they are open to anything that the devil could hit them with. And there are many things out there, but as believers, we want to walk in obedience to the Lord and we want to honor the Lord with our finances, lest our finances lose value. And they certainly don't have the ability to deliver us. Only God does. God says for the, for the tither and the giver, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed. Why would nations call you blessed? Why would others that don't know the Lord look at you and say you're blessed? Because they can see God's hand upon your life. They can see it. They can measure your life, take a look at it, and say, wow, the God that they serve is performing in their life. The truths they proclaim are producing in their life. Praise God. So my friends, let's keep money in the proper category. Let's keep it in its right place, which is what? It is a tool for kingdom usage. It is a blessing that is to be appropriated in covenant 
practice. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. And one of those practices is tithes and offerings so that the Lord is glorified so that we are blessed and that his kingdom, which is an unshakable eternal kingdom continues to move forward. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Money can't deliver. Only God can. What about the rich man that Jesus referred to who had so many goods that he never had to work another day in his life? He had so much wealth, he was on a permanent retirement plan, and he was still young. So he had the barns that he had. The plan was tear those down. They're too small. Build bigger barns. Eat, drink, and be happy. And the Lord said, fool, tonight I'm requiring your soul of you. And that person perished in their sins, lost and separated from God, and all of their money could not help them could not help them, could not deliver them. So we must keep money in the proper place and understand that it is for the practice of obeying the covenant. Praise the Lord. Father, I pray for your people today as they're honoring you with their finances, that they always keep money in the right lane, which is a lane of covenant practice. I thank you, Father, that the temptation to spend it all upon themselves, to consume even the holy tithe, would be a deceitful trick of the enemy that they will never fall for. I thank you, Father God, that while the world would plead for your people to just go full hog into the useless vanity of the world system. I thank you that your people are governed by truths that are found in your word and that they consider the tithe to be holy and that they will never eat or consume what is holy and what belongs to you. Now we thank you, Father God, that you're on the scene working in the lives of your people, delivering them from every trial, every challenge and difficulty. We thank you, Father God, that the enemy is rebuked and that the devourer has to stand back because of the divine protection that is associated in the life of a tither and a giver. Now, Father, we thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And around the world we say, Amen. Praise God. Now, let's honor the Lord with the tithes and offerings. For those of you that prefer to mail them in, please send them to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina. The zip code is 28654. For those of you that prefer to bring your tithes and offerings in online over the internet, please visit the ministry website, stephenbrooks.org. There's a link on the homepage. It has a red heart on it, and it says give. You can click that and bring the holy tithe in right there. The tithe is 10% of all of your increase, 10% of the monies that come into your hand. If you would also like to sow special seed, we have various projects that we're focused on in this season that has an orange banner on the website that says projects. You can click on that and give as your heart desires as you are led by the Holy Spirit. Father, bless your people with fresh anointing and great breakthroughs. We thank you, Father God, for biblical understanding of your word and the purpose of money. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Praise God. Now, let's go back to the book of Ecclesiastes, and I want to go to chapter 3. And today, I would like to discuss with you about the great importance of obeying divine signals. Wow, praise God. Mm -mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Many of you are going to get very developed in this area of discerning these signals. I have found in life that the weightier or more important something is that God is striving to get over to you concerning what you're supposed to do or not do, then oftentimes the signals get amplified depending upon the urgency or the weight of that message that God is directing you forward in or holding you back from. And we need to become very, very uh, quick to respond in these areas. So today let's talk about obeying divine signals. 
Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are listening. I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation be flowing today, that our ears be open to hear spiritually what the Holy Spirit is saying today as the Word of God is illuminated from heaven on high. Father, we give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Now, many of the various segments of life are laid out. Not only life, but also death concerning events that are critical in the area of timing. Verse 7, a time to tear, a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. These things are very important to understand the timing of God because we can have natural tendencies where we may say, now is the time. But yet, in God's eyes, God might be thinking, well, they're picking up on the assignment that I have for them, but it's not yet the timing. So we have to make sure we catch. God's timing. And there's other times where God wants us to move and step forward. And we may think, oh, well, now's not really a good time. Analytically, this doesn't seem to line up. But if that's when God is saying to move, then, then that's when we must go. Praise God. You know, it's also very important in the area of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, particularly with the gift of working of miracles that you move with the anointing of that moment of the timing that's on that moment. You know, the gift of faith is the supernatural gift to receive a mer- to receive a miracle. But the gift of working of miracles means that God's going to do a miracle, but it's going to involve our participation, whether it's Moses stretching out the rod in front of 3 million Israelites and watching him do that. You know, he wasn't allowed to do that in practice. Well, Lord, maybe I could, maybe I can turn around sideways and stick it out. If this doesn't work, this is really embarrassing. No, Lord said, stretch it out. And he did stretch out your hand. And he did. And the waters begin to part. So there is an, there's a personal involvement we have when God wants to uh, manifest the gift of the spirit of working of miracles. And so, so much of that also depends upon our timing. So when God wants to do it, we have to step into it then. Woo, praise God. But when you do, the waters part. Praise God. So with all of these various examples, like verse 2, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest, you understand that there's also divine timing that governs Everything, even the atomic clock that the scientists have set up where you, you know, it's never a second late or a second early. You have to be on God's clock, Mm -mm, which is the most accurate system. God has a timing for everything. That's very important to know. And your success in life depends on how well you obey these divine signals. Wow, because there's a lot riding on it. Praise the Lord. And I believe for many of you that are watching, you're in this area where signals are going to be coming. And once you receive the clear signal, you're going to know exactly what you're supposed to do. Because again, the signal is also an indicator of God's time clock. Woo! Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go over to the book of Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. And I would like for us to drop down to verse 20. So they took their journey from Sukkoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them. This would, of course, be the the Lord going before the children of Israel. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to do what? To lead the way. And by night. In the pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So, whenever that cloud would stop, that meant that they, as a nation, would stop and then they would be able to pitch their tents and set up. 
for as long as there was no supernatural movement. My friends, this was also one of the miraculous ways in which they could camp in the wilderness for 40 years and yet not be attacked by wild animals. Remember, we have the story of David, young David, who killed what? The lion and the bear. You have to realize that in that area of ancient Israel, uh, you know, you're very close to Egypt. You're very close to North Africa and Africa, of course, uh, even today known for their, their lions and their safaris and the big parks and stuff like that. But that was a natural land bridge. Those animals would just walk back and forth in Israel at that time had a lot of lions and uh, uh, bears and things like that. And uh, they were all along the Jordan in, in the thickets. And they were also even in those remote uh, desert type areas. And, you know, it's kind of sad, but the last lions in Israel that we knew of were all killed off by the crusaders when they came from Europe uh, to the Holy Land. I wish they hadn't have done that, but they killed the remaining lions off. But yes, that area, even the Negev, the southern area of Israel, even that Sinai Peninsula. Yes, there were many wild animals, the lions and uh, uh, even leopards and so forth. So, my friends, God was protecting them. Why? Because when you follow divine signs and that leading, there's a protection that comes along with that. But if you go on your own, <laughs> well, you know, it seems like God wants to set camp. But you know what? My legs are really feeling very spry. And I, I, I've got a lot of energy. Y'all go in camp. I'm going to keep on walking. Well, you walk, you get out there on your own, and you really actually are on your own. You don't have God's protection with you. And so then you would be vulnerable to some of these uh, predator-type animals. But my friends, they only moved as they were directed by God. Their movement was governed by supernatural movement of the cloud and the pillar of fire. And of course, we know also that the Lord was in the fire and that he was also in the cloud. Mm. Now, I want to say this. Let this go down into your spirit today, that your walk in the supernatural can only be complete when the Lord is leading you. Yes, while God gave us a brain, and we're going to use our brains to make good decisions, to walk in wisdom, to, lose, to use logic, and to think. Yes, we're going, to, we're going to avail ourselves to what God has equipped us with. But you cannot ignore the element of supernatural which requires walking in that with a leading of God. Woo, praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Without that leading, uh, there's going to be a, 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 an incompleteness, a gap of things that you want to get into that you can't. Or the gap will cause you to step into something either late or perhaps prematurely. Wow. And they both have very negative results when that is experienced. So we want to stay on timing. Praise God. Let's go over now to Psalm 23, perhaps the most famous Psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23 and verse one. And here David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, a shepherd is going to be leading and guiding the sheep. The sheep don't tell the shepherd, where they want to go. Now the sheep can be hungry, they could be thirsty, but it's up to the shepherd to lead them based upon his decisions of where the water's at, where the food is going to be at for them to eat. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So divine leading of a shepherd leads you into a place where your needs are met. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. So the leading of the Lord takes you into a place where you are able to proclaim like David did, I shall not want. Well, Pastor Stephen, there's something I'm really wanting, yet I, I don't yet have the money for it. It could be that the reason that you don't have the money is that it's not time for it yet. Now think about that just for a moment. Well, Pastor Stephen, I'm using my faith, and so far God hasn't answered the prayer, and I still don't have it. Well, when its timing is right, 
then you will have it. And sometimes that's why some believers, they get a little discouraged or they, they think, well, what's going on here? Sometimes the only thing going on is a timing issue. You can be doing everything right and everything's working exactly the way it's supposed to. You are taking the right steps in the right direction, but we must also realize that there is the timing area with God, things that he sees, things that only he knows, and you have to just stay there. And the fact that you don't have it yet would be a great indicator also that it's not time for you to have it yet. I, I know that can be tough because we all want it now. Mm. Well, Pastor Stephen, if we don't have it now, what should be our attitude? One of constant thanksgiving. That's very, very important in this area of syncing up with God's timing. Now, we certainly don't want God's timing to be delayed, but there are some people that are believing God for a house. They want to get into a, a house, and it hasn't happened yet. But the thing is, is that they're not thanking God for the one-bedroom apartment that they have right now. Matter of fact, they're complaining about it. But they're believing God for the house, but yet the extra for the money, maybe for a down payment to buy a home, whatever it might be, they just, it hasn't showed up. What do we do in the interim? Be thankful. Be thankful for that one bedroom apartment. Pastor Stephen, I'm believing God for a new car. Well, thank God for what you have, whether it's a used car or if you have to get around on a bicycle. Thank God. Thank God for it. Thank God for everything He's done for you thus far. And even the things that you're believing God to do, just go ahead and start thanking Him now for them. And when you build that attitude of thanksgiving, you also make yourself irresistible to the Lord. Because, my friends, I think that you know some people that, like, I've met before. They constantly, all they have is a prayer request list. That's all it ever is. It's nothing but an ongoing list. And if something on the list ever does get answered, it's replaced instantly <laughs> with another or more multiple uh, petitions that are on that list. And there's never like a time where the list is put down and hands are raised and thanksgiving is given for what God has already done. Wow. My friends, as we are endeavoring to sync with the divine timing of God, let us also be very, very thankful for all that we have. And even if you're in a place where all you have is a box of crackers, thank God for the crackers. Hallelujah. Amen. Because there's more, there's more good things on the way. But thank God for the crackers. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, the Lord is good. I would say that over the years of my spiritual journey, that I, I can definitely see that there is a deeper spiritual level, a deeper spiritual development within the hearts of those Christians who do exude thankfulness. Wow. Hey, if somebody buys you a meal, don't just take that for granted because they, you know, your meal was only $7 or whatever it might be. Thank them. Thank God and thank them. Thank you for that meal. Mm. What does Thanksgiving do? <laughs> it provokes uh, uh, repetitive blessings. It, re it provokes more pouring out from the person who appreciates that somebody acknowledged uh, their gift. Praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Praise God. You know, my wife was instrumental in uh, one time in helping somebody get a car. A person had no car. And uh, I mean, they're, they're like stranded in a way in the sense they have no car. They have no money to get a car. They have... Uh, no credit, even to try to finance a vehicle, and they're in a pretty desperate strait. You know, you know what my wife did? She went by the wisdom and leading of the Holy Spirit and talked to one of the uh, my uh, uh, deacons in the church and said, "Hey, uh, I feel led to ask you: Is there anything that you can do to help this person?" I, and my wife, being led of the Holy Spirit, talked to this person, and the next thing you know, this person. Uh, is able to give a free car. And so my wife helps orchestrate it, uh, gets everything shifted, and the car's totally paid for, and gets everything squared up, all paperwork, and then uh, they take the car and the keys and give it to that person. And you know what? The person never thanked 
my wife never thanked that person. You know what the person did? The person said, Jesus gave me a car. God always takes care of me. And I'm thinking, well, hey, if that's the only avenue in which this works, <laughs> then, you know, the ne next time you have a need like that, because oftentimes people that are in those situations, they're, they're, they're going to repeat this, um, this process of having to learn these things. Then, you know, then ask Jesus to do it again for you. But the fact is, is that Jesus worked through my wife. And if my wife had not been a blessing, that person would be walking. And that is the truth. So, you know, when you do something to help somebody and they don't even say anything, they don't say thank you or anything like, or anything like that, then there's a disconnect there. There's a disconnect. And that's the last thing we want when we want God's timing to be coming forth. Let's not by all means, do anything that would cause it to be delayed. Wow. I also think in this area of syncing with God's timing, that if we're not thankful, then even if we receive something, we may need a, another dose or it may be incomplete. When Jesus anointed of the spirit told the 10 lepers to go show themselves to the priest and they're healed as they went and out of 10, only one came back. Only one came back and thanked him. And then it says, as he thanked the Lord, thanked Jesus and worshiped him, it says he was made whole. So the other nine, while they were healed of leprosy and the open wounds and all of the, all of the stuff oozing out of them, all of that, all of that's cleansed, but yet they could have a stub as an arm, they could have had missing fingers, you know, because all of that stuff just begins to decay and rot and fall off. It's such a horrible, horrible disease, but yet they're healed. But this man came back with a thankful heart, thanked God for what he had done. And then he goes into a new level where it says now that he's made whole. So that's totally different. That's totally different. So if you're not thankful, you, you may need an, another dose or you may not fully yet have arrived. So in this place, in this place of sinking with God's timing so that you're walking in, in step with the Lord, make sure that your heart is full of thanksgiving. Every time you get in your vehicle, thank God for it. And when you do that, you'll always be riding in a beautiful vehicle. Oh, praise God. Every time you put your clothes on, put your shoes on, just say, Lord, I thank you that I have shoes. <laughs> thank you for the health to put shoes on. There's people that can't dress themselves. Thank God for your mind, your ability to think. And if you don't have a job, thank God that you have the ability to get up and use your brain to apply for another one, to go out and search for one. Thank God for everything. Hallelujah. Everything good that he has done for you and is doing. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So when the Lord leads, as we see in Psalm 23, there is also provision that is on time with that. Praise God. It's very, very important. I talk often to a lot of aspiring ministers that feel the call and have legitimate calls into ministry. But I understand also that you have to go with the timing of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I was working at a company, a, a, a large corporation, and I woke up one morning to go into work, and uh, I got up at six to pray, spend time with the Lord before I went to work. And when I got up in my prayer time, the Lord spoke to me. It was actually audible. Um, now, nobody else heard it, but I heard it. He spoke to me, and he said, turn in your two-week notice today. You're going into the ministry full time. And when he said that, I only had three meetings booked for the whole year. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, okay, Lord, I thought, okay, but am, am I to act like I didn't hear him say that? Yeah. Well, Pastor Stephen, what if, what if it was the devil that said, no, 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 it was God. And when God speaks, you know, it's God. And so I turned in my two week notice and, you know, I've been running ever since. I haven't been going around, you know, knocking on a door to try to get into a meeting somewhere. No, I've been busy ever since. Why? The timing. The timing. What happens if you go prematurely? You go on your own. 
And if you go on your own, now you're responsible for footing the bill. See, when Jesus sent the 12 out and they sent the 70 out and they start coming back and they're giving these reports, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. And, uh, you know, they're all excited. And the Lord asked them a question. And he said, when I sent you out, and he sent them out two by two, when I sent you out, did you lack anything? And remember, he sent them out and told them intentionally, Lee, you know, you don't need to be carrying all this stuff. Just go, you know, you don't be, you don't need suitcases and you don't need all of this or whatever, just go. And so he sends them, they come back and he said, when I sent you, and remember that's the catchphrase. He said, when I sent you, did you lack anything? And they all said, no, we didn't lack anything. So what's the revelation? The revelation is that if he sends you, he's responsible for you. But if you send yourself, Maybe because you're zealous, maybe because you see a need that's good, but that's not going to work in these, in, in this walk of the supernatural. You can only go if he sends you, because if you send yourself, uh, you're going to need deep pockets. If you're going to send yourself, like for example, in the television ministry, well, pastor Stephen, I think I'll do that too. Well, go right ahead. But if he hasn't called you, get ready to burn through a whole bunch of money <laughs> because there is nothing cheap about television, airtime cost, production cost, all of the other things that are baked into that. Wow. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes with that. Praise the Lord. So I stepped in the television ministry because the Lord called me into it. But even with the calling, I had to be very careful with the timing. But when we finally went, we went and we've never been late on one payment. Praise God. And right now we have a coverage that covers a viewing audience of over 1 billion people. So the reason that we're able to do that is because of being sent, but going also with the timing. Woo. Praise God. There's a lot of preachers that are under a lot of pressure because they're doing things that God never sent them into to do now because of, because God's not in it and they still continue with it. They have to carry that load. It would be better just to cut, call the whole thing off, shut that project down and just walk away from it. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. The timing of the Lord. Let's go over to the gospel of John and take a look at a day in the life of Jesus. This is John chapter seven. Uh, this is a, this is very interesting. Praise the Lord. There are some things that uh, create, I would call like a majority crowd. And if you don't go with them, then you're sneered at or snickered at or misunderstood. And some events or some situations, the pressure can be amped more. Take a look at this in John chapter seven, verse one. After these things, John walked, excuse me, Jesus walked in Galilee for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him and they meant it too. They actually were wanting to assassinate him. Things like that. You can't treat lightly things like that. You can't laugh it off and say, aha, uh -huh. you know, go ahead and take your best shot. You're going to miss. No, you have to be aware of things like that. Don't tempt God. Don't act stupid. Um, there are certain nations I would never go to. Well, why not, Pastor Stephen? You should just go in faith. Oh, uh, well, you, you, if you go and God didn't send you, you're, all you are is you're just walking around as ransom material <laughs> for some rebel terrorist group to grab you. And there are some, they don't even want the ransom. They'll make you disappear. They'll make you disappear. I had a pastor tell me that his daughter went overseas to a certain country. I won't tell you which one, but she did some things where some pictures were taken and uh, it was just a fun uh, picture taking a uh, moment, no, nothing bad, nothing wrong. She just took some pictures with some certain people and it was a good clean picture. It was totally fine. But then with those pictures having been taken and then posted on social media, she then goes into a neighboring country and the neighboring country saw her walking around and they were aware of some social media posts and they said, Oh, she's a spy. She's a spy. What's the reality? She's a harmless young lady that took some pictures and didn't realize the ramifications of what that might cause. And so her dad gets a call in the middle of the night from an FBI agent because the FBI had a base 
in that country and said, you need to get your daughter out of the country, out of this particular country. Immediately, they have put a $5 million hit on her head. They don't want the ransom. They're, they're not concerned about that. They want to kill her because they think she's a spy. And you're talking about pressure. So her dad, yeah, got her out of there because he, he knew exactly where she was at. And she, at that point, was, didn't know didn't know that this whole thing is cooking going on, that people are actually searching, hunting for her. <laughs> oh, my Lord. So they got her out. But that's one part of the world, one country that she'll never, ever go back into. Now, verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Oh, well, this is the big one. Well, now if there was any feast that you have to go up to, this is it. And we've got to be there on time. Bright and early, just like everybody else. Now watch this. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. So you have to be able to deal with that area where others, maybe out of jealousy, maybe out of a critical spirit, want to push you into something that's not God's timing for you. Now for them, hey, your timing is whatever, because you don't even understand these things. Go ahead and do what you do. But for you, when you're walking with the Lord, and you have to walk in sync in order to experience the supernatural of God, uh, you have to be very aware of these divine signals. Praise God. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. <laughs> right. That's the way some people live. Their time, whatever it's now, let's just, you know, but when you're walking with the Lord, these things become different. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast for my time has not yet come. Isn't that interesting? My time has not yet come. Well, they all leave the others and they go. But what happens? He holds back maybe for a day or two and then he goes. But now when he goes, he's going in the timing of God, his father. Very, very important. The, the hour, the day can be dramatically different based upon divine timing. You could be at a certain place out in the ocean, and the sea can be smooth as glass. But three months later, you could be out there, and it could be the uh, Hurricane Alley, where waves are uh, you know, swelling up to 40, 60, sometimes even rarely, but sometimes even 100 feet. And uh, very, very hard for any type of vehicle to survive in a situation like that. So timing is very important. Learned that flow. Praise the Lord. I have a prophet friend of mine, and many people say that he's the prophet that is in the right place at the right time. Praise the Lord. Well, that means that you're walking in that supernatural element. He and I have had a lot of fun, a lot of good laughs together about this area of timing. One time he flew to a certain nation in Africa, flew from America to a certain nation in Africa. He was going to minister at a small church over there and was going to help them and help build the church. And he's a prophet and he's going to prophesy and teach them how to get activated in the spiritual gifts, the gift of prophecy. And so he flies over there with his assistant, which is a long way to fly, gets off the plane there at the airport and waits to be picked up and the person never showed up and he got totally stranded there. Uh, something happened where uh, the pastor just said, oh, you maybe got nervous and said, I don't want to do this or misled him. And he's over there stranded, no ride and nobody will answer his calls and he's, he's just left to himself. So he told this, uh, his assistant, he said, well, we're here. Let's just, uh, and he said, I know we're here by God's leading, so let's just walk around the city and see what's going on. So now remember, he's just finished like a 14 hour international flight. He was wearing flight clothes so you could be comfortable. He's wearing blue jeans that have holes in them by the knees. He's wearing a t shirt that was, you know, just for comfort, like a, just, just a simple t shirt. And he's walking around pulling a suitcase. <laughs> And he sees a big Colosseum 
that appeared to be full with a lot of activity. He told his assistant, he said, let's walk over there and see what's going on. And they get, they get over there and people, some people are still going in. He said, let's go inside. And they realized this is a religious meeting, like a large national type, some type of religious convention. And uh, uh, as they start walking into this big Colosseum, an usher comes up and says, oh, he said, you, sir, and point it to my prophet friend. He said, you and your, your, uh, the person with you, follow me, follow me. And he begins to take them inside this Colosseum. And my, my friend said, oh, we're going to get a good seat. Uh, he's taking us to get a good seat. And it, th- this usher began taking them closer and closer to the front. And he thought, oh, I'm going to get a really good seat. But the usher took him all the way to the front. And when he got all the way to the front, the minister that was speaking and was being televised to the whole nation live on television the, uh, through satellite TV, the minister reached down, walked over from the pulpit area, reached down, handed him the microphone and said, prophesy. And the spirit of the Lord came on him and he prophesied the word of the Lord for the whole nation. Praise God with his tore up jeans, with his hair all messed up and with a suitcase in the other hand. <laughs> Timing, the timing of the Lord, praise God. Now, he told me later, my friend told me later, what he didn't know is that the conference host, the main speaker, was up there and he was ministering and he stopped and said, the Lord just told me that a man of God, a prophet from America is going to walk into this meeting and he will give the word of the Lord for the whole nation. And now my friend had no idea. So he's just kind of stumbling around and walks in, but he walked in in the spirit with the timing of God. And I see events and moments and miracles like that unfolding for you. Why? You recognize divine signals and you obey them. Praise God. Just like Jesus did. They all said, go up. I mean, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. You can't, you got to be there. He's like, uh, I'll, I'll go in my own timing, in my own way. The rest of you can do whatever you want because that's what you're going to do anyhow. That's the way you live and govern your lives. But I don't operate like that. But all the pressure, uh, even to get him to make the misstep, praise God. But you have to hold steady with what you know that God wants you to do. Again, let's go to the book of John to the 11th chapter, John 11 verse one through three. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister, Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with the fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Be extra careful in the area of emotions. Emotions will want to grip you and grab you and say, we must respond now. Why? Because you love that person and it's genuine. It's sincere, but that also has to be submitted to the heavenly father under the direction of his divine signaling Mm, because divine signaling overrides even uh, these heartfelt yearnings or desires that we would have. And they, they, of course are based out of love. So they're good. Verse five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Wow. Incredible. Of course he shows up. They said, Hey, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But Jesus still was not allowed to go until after a two day delay, divine delay. And then there was the release. Now remember when you go in divine timing, you go in the spirit and things work for you. If you go on your own with no Uh, ability to pick up divine signals and you just, you know, you're just open to whatever happens. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have an ability to go with the flow, but if you're not following the leading of divine signals, then you miss, you miss those power moments. You miss those, that, that supernatural walk that God wants you to experience. And of course we know what came out of this. Lazarus was resurrected from the dead praise God, but you have to know when to proceed forward 
also when to stop and hold up. Because it could be that it's not that God's saying no, it could be that He wants you to go, it's just that the timing is not quite where it's supposed to be. So what do you do? You wait and you stay thankful. Well, Lord, I'll enjoy a couple of more days while I'm here and uh, hang out here and, uh, and, and uh, pray and enjoy the day. Praise the Lord. Mm-mm. Have some more hummus while we're here in Bethany, whatever the case might be. But don't override the signal. Sometimes the signals can be very, very strong, such as even the voice of the Lord. Or an angelic encounter where an angel could say, move forward in this, or uh, hold up, or whatever it might be. There's many, many ways in which God can indicate these signals. But for the Christian, the divine signal primarily is going to be an inner, an inner signal. Yes, you can have the firework moments when they, that signal can be much more uh, broadcast on a higher frequency, such as God talking to you where you actually hear him. But also we have to understand that many times these divine signals, such as externally in the old Testament cloud by day, fire by night for us in the new Testament, it's now internalized through the indwelling presence of the Holy spirit within your spirit. Praise God. This is very important. Acts chapter 27 Acts chapter 27. Mm-mm. I see you as being a person of divine timing. Glory to God in God's timing. Wow. Acts chapter 27, verse 9. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Now, Paul's trying to be very nice, very polite, but there's a lot riding on this. But he's basically saying, if we leave this harbor and take this trip, uh, we're all going to die. We're going, we're going to the bottom of the Mediterranean. It's going to be over. Wow. Pretty weighty. Now notice again, he said, I perceive. What is that? The ability to pick up a divine signal. Very, very importantly though, the willingness to obey a divine signal. Now in his case, ah, wow. What do you do? I mean, he's a prisoner. It's not like he can say, well, you're not getting me on that ship. He has to, Uh, that's, that's, you know, part of, uh, of the journey. So he can't say, no, he's a prisoner. So he's forced to go along on a ride that's going to end in all of them getting killed. Uh, it, this is a disaster. Wow. And he, he already knows it. He already knows it. How? Inner perception. There can be times the, the signal can be very, very strong. And the, the more that's riding on it, oftentimes the stronger the signal is. Mm-mm. God's going to get it over to you, but you must make sure that you obey the signal. And in this case, at least what Paul can do is warn them. That's what he can do. And he does his part. The rest is now on them. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. So they're going to base this whole thing not on divine signals because they're not able to discern or pick that up. They're going to base it on profit and loss. And the owner of the ship is thinking, I've got cargo to transport. I've got money to make, and I don't want this ship sitting in the harbor, uh, not making money. It's like having a, 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 you know, commercial airline, Delta United or whoever it might be, uh, American and the plane just sitting there. uh, So it's not flying passengers around. It's not making money. That's the way the owner is viewing the ship. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also. Watch out for majority voice. And majority, hey, that's fine. But watch out for majority voice when you're getting something different, when you're getting a completely different signal. Because it could be that the majority is ignoring 
or overriding, or if it's unbelievers, unable to detect the divine signal. And again, because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix. Verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out the sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurachlodon, which in our language is basically, it means a fierce northeaster, uh, nor'easter. These winds blowing down from the Arctic north, just coming in with a blast that changed everything within seconds. And they went on a ride for about two weeks that would be like a non stop roller coaster ride at an amusement park. Just think about doing that for two weeks. You know, you do a roller coaster for three minutes, maybe four, that's good. But think about doing that for four, excuse me, for two weeks non stop. It's no fun anymore. But eventually, because of Paul's prayers, God showed mercy and their lives were spared. But the ship was lost, all the money down to the bottom of the sea. Wow, it never had to happen. It never had to happen. Well, Pastor Stephen, God's timing is an inconvenience for me. Well, that's okay. Be inconvenienced and stay alive. Be inconvenienced and, the, you, you know, your house, your car, everything's okay. Your ship is fine. Praise the Lord. It's God's protections that oftentimes cause us to put the brakes on when others rush forward, not knowing what they're about to get into. Very quickly, let's go over to Romans chapter 8. As we're looking at obeying divine signals, let's understand that for the New Testament believer, you can get some tremendous signals at times, but so often these are inner signals. Romans 8 verse 14, for as many as are led, led how? By the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, we don't want to remain in infancy as Christians. We want to grow into sonship, sons of God. What's one of the key indicators of the growth of coming into maturity? The ability to be led and to discern divine signals. How was this, how was this done? Verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, not with your toe, not with your elbow, not with emotional feelings, but with our spirit. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Okay, so because the witness of the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit, therefore we know it's not external, it's inner, because your spirit is the hidden man of the heart. Praise God. So this is an inner witness. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. What is the most important thing as a child of God that you could ever need to be established in and know the fact that you are saved and born again? How is that made known to you? It's made known to you through an inner witness that you're born again, that your sins are forgiven and that you are now saved. And somebody may say, well, I don't believe it. That's fine. You're entitled to uh, your opinion, but I know it because I've been born again. Well, how do you know? I don't even need to explain it. I know that I know by the Holy spirit who is living on the inside of me, bearing witness internally that I am what I am a child of God. Woo. Praise the Lord. And nobody talked me into it. So nobody can talk me out of it. God saved me and he has made known to me that I am now his child. Praise God. So my friends in this area of divine signaling, you must be able to detect that by the Holy Spirit. So often it's inner. Paul said, I perceive, I perceive that this voyage is going to end in disaster and we're all going to get killed. Wow. And there's a lot of Christians. They don't pray and they don't, uh, they don't speak in tongues to build up and edify their spirit. And so they, they are walking in a natural and intellectual realm only. And they are unable to get on this frequency where they can get these signals. 
Wow. And sometimes even still in that state, it's like God is trying to scream to them. Don't get on that plane or don't take that journey or don't step out now. Or it could be he's saying, go now for now is my time, but you must go now. It's the last train out. Mm, wow. Praise the Lord. And it, an inability to distinguish divine signals can leave a Christian, uh, can leave a Christian in a place of frustration. Wow. And they think, why, why did this happen? Well, it could have happened because the Lord tried to get it over to you, but you were not able to pick it up. Mm, and he may, as he often does in order to keep us humble, he may even send a messenger whom we don't prefer or whom we don't Maybe don't want to hear it from that person, but that person could be the voice of the Lord, just like the donkey was to Balaam. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be aware of that. We want to walk in humility, but I've seen oftentimes God will speak through very lowly means. Uh, the person could even be gruff or rough. The person could even be crude. The person might not even be a Christian, but yet God is having that person say something that is vital for you to hear or vital for you to know. And just because God's working through that type of a vessel doesn't mean you should disregard or ignore the warning. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for everyone today, hands up that have open hearts that want to, to be able to very clearly pick up these divine signals. I pray father that you ha help them to walk with like a, a built in supernatural radar, uh, even for underwater supernatural sonar or even GPS as we would say, but that all realms are covered GPS in space and uh, radar for the air and sonar for the water from the lowest to the highest. Let them be able to discern divine signals. Thank you, Father God. Let them walk in sync with you. And Father, may they, may they always be found giving you thanksgiving. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you that you're going to bring everything that you promised to pass, but it must come forth in divine timing. Not our timing, but in your timing. And we give you all of the praise because you know best, and we worship you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And around the world we say, Amen. Praise God. Now for those who would be watching today's message, Perhaps you were just curious about what this was, and you clicked on it, and you've been listening, and you think, you know, I'm liking this. I, I want to know this God. I want to know Jesus. Today is your day. Don't miss the divine signal. Today is your day. Get your life right with God right now. That's the signal coming to you. Pastor Stephen, what should I do? Pray this prayer after me. Pray it to God. Pray it to Jesus. Say, Jesus... I'm a sinner, but you died on the cross to save me from my sins. Jesus, come into my heart right now. Save me. Wash my sins away with your precious blood. Jesus, write my name in your book of life and step into my life today and lead me and guide me. In your name I pray. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus has heard you cry out to him and he has said, yes, let me be the first to say welcome to the family of God. You are now a child of God. Praise the Lord, a son, a daughter of the most high. Praise God. Now I want us to take Holy Communion. I want you to grab some grape juice. I want you to grab some uh, unleavened bread. Get a little wafer, a little cracker, whatever you have to work with. And let's pray over it. This is very important today that we take communion. Father, we thank you for the juice, the bread. We bless it right now through this prayer. We set it apart as being holy. And we thank you that this is the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we thank you that we are saved, we're born again, and we thank you for divine 
signals. Thank you, O oh God. Hallelujah. That you are signaling us with clear directions and instructions. Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. You know, I'm just getting this right now. There can be times where you get a signal, don't eat that food. Don't eat it. And if you eat it, it might, and it might just be a little quick signal, but if you eat it, then it's going to upset your stomach. And the next thing you know, you've got three or four hours of trying to grind through that. And, you know, then you're, you know, taking Pepto-Bismol or, you know, Tums or Rolades or whatever it might be. But the whole thing is, if you would have followed and obeyed, obeyed that signal, you could have diverted all of that and missed all of that. Praise God. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Medication could be that the Holy Spirit would say, the doctor's doing the best he can, but don't take that one. That's not going to work with your system. Well, these types of things we need to, when we hear them, understand that God means business. Mm -mm. I had a prophet uh, that warned some young people, don't go on that ministry trip. Don't go on that mission trip. And uh, he, he pleaded with the pastor and the leadership team, uh, cancel this trip. Something's terribly wrong. And the pastor said, oh, there's nothing wrong with going on a mission trip. They wouldn't hit anyhow. They got over there and a civil war broke out. The guerrilla warfare uh, be a fighting began. And they took all the Christians that were on that missionary trip, chopped them up into pieces and threw their body parts into the river and fed them to the crocodiles. Pastor Stephen, that is horrible beyond imagination. Yep, it sure is. And the whole time, God was almost like screaming at them, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Praise God. Now, that, that prophet, could, he just picked it up super easy. Hey, that's going to end in the disaster. And that wasn't even his personal life. That's their life. We should have the ability to discern what God wants to do for our lives. And when you get, you get developed, he can help you also in the area of, you know, helping others that maybe are not quite hearing like they should praise God. Mm -mm. Father, thank you for the flesh of Jesus. As we receive it, we thank you that we are receivers and obeyers of divine signals. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, that we will not be pressured into doing something that we know inherently and, in eter and internally is wrong. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the Lord's body. We're talking about days of peace. We're talking about experiencing uh, comfort. We're not talking about frazzled situations where in, we're in something that we walked into, uh, and now it's a major problem when we never should have been there in the first place. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Be very, very careful with divine timing. I can talk about these things, but um, what is the purpose of, a, of myself in some ways, in this case, trying to mentor those that this is new for. What is the purpose of a mentor? My purpose is to divert pain away from your life so that you don't have to go and learn all this firsthand. So you can listen to me, share these stories, teach these things that you can say, ah, oh, now I know this so I can steer clear of these timing issues that would cause problems. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Now, Father, today, if there is anybody who has sinned against us in any way, we forgive them, we bless them, and on we go with you with hearts of thanksgiving, thoughts that are sensitive to the leading of your spirit. We thank you, O oh God. We praise you. We praise you as we now receive the blood of Jesus in his name. Amen. Let's protect together. Praise God. Disobedience to divine signals can cause life-altering repercussions. 
You know, there's a really good pastor. He told, he told the story that uh, prayer was requested from him to come and minister to a, uh, another preacher who was very sick, was at the hospital. And so this, this minister who was invited or, or, or asked to come and uh, go pray for that man, he said, okay, I'll go pray for him. So he uh, gets dressed, he gets his clothes on, and not only that, but this minister who's going to go pray for the sick preacher, uh, this minister really loved that man because that was a good preacher. Well, while this minister was getting dressed and getting ready to go, when he walked to his car to get into his car to drive there, the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, do not go there, do not pray for him. And it was audible. It was so strong, it was audible. And he thought about that for a moment, and he got out of the car, went back inside, and thought, Lord, I, I don't understand that. I don't know why you would tell me that, but I'm going to obey you. And so there were some other ministers that were going to go also, and he, he called them and said, the Lord told me not to go there. The Lord told me, do not pray for him. And all of the other ministers said, well, if the Lord told you that, we're going to follow in line with that. We're not going either, except for one. One minister said, I'm going to go anyhow. I'm going to go on down there anyhow. And that one minister went down there and prayed for the preacher. The preacher died anyhow the next day. And the next day, that preacher, he did something where uh, the enemy tricked him on something. And within two days, he was dead. And you step back and you look at it and you think, what happened? What happened is that one minister did something in disobedience. So I'm trying to say that even with our knowledge of the word, there can be certain dynamics that we don't always understand. Oh, Pastor Steve, we're supposed to pray for the sick. And Jesus said, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. I'm well familiar with those verses just as you are. But there can be times when God says, no. Do not pray for that person. And sometimes he will say, why? He, sometimes, I've had him tell me sometimes why. But there have been a few very, very rare times when the Lord hasn't said anything except, no, do not. Do not go over there. Do not pray for that person. And uh, when I get something that's really dramatic like that, I've learned, obey the Lord. Now, those, those moments are rare. But what I'm trying to say is God is very serious about his uh, signaling to us about what he's trying to tell us. And when we follow him, it works really well. And there's protection. There's no lack. Amen. So let's make sure we always have clear guidance and direction, especially in areas that are uh, big decisions and so forth. Heavenly Father, bless your people. I thank you, O oh God, that as the Israelites of old were led by the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, Father, that your people, although we don't have a visible, physical reference like that, I thank you that we actually still have a greater witness. We actually still have a greater mechanism of being led, and that's God, the Holy Spirit, on the inside of us. So, Father, I thank you for your people, that they won't miss it. They're always going to get the timing right, and they'll be so thrilled in their hearts as they experience those special moments. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you back next time. Bye-bye.